Assalamu alaikum. My name is Fadl Wazaz. I wanted to do a presentation on one of the names of God, and it's Al Ba'ith. I actually want to start a series. I've been meaning to start that for a very long time, and I'm trying to figure out the process of how to begin introducing the names of God, and that has been on my mind for quite a long time. So I want to begin with Al Ba'ith, and the reason is I'm going to be using that in my series of videos also on sexual harassment. And I'll explain that in the video in the video on sexual harassment. The next one will be about sexual harassment versus promiscuity because I think a lot of times when we speak about um, sexual harassment, people get alarmed and they start to think you're trying to promote promiscuity. And an example of that would be we're speaking about U.S. foreign policy and people get upset and they start talking, they start pushing terrorism in your face. Um, recently, for example, two candidates for, con uh, for Congress who are running for Congress, two Muslim women um, right here in Minnesota were harassed by somebody accusing them of being supporters of Hamas. They probably never met Hamas, don't even know who Hamas is. But that's really the same psychology that we have in our community, is when you start speaking about uh, sexual harassment, people jump in and they promote, they push promiscuity. But there is another video that is coming up, and I will discuss that particular case of sexual harassment versus promiscuity. I want to separate those discussions because our community needs to realize, just like when we discuss foreign policy, U.S. foreign policy, it has its own scope and its own boundaries, and we must grant it uh, those boundaries and not interrupt and undermine it with Hamas or ISIS or whatever. And when we discuss terrorism, we can invite people like Robert Pape, who has a tremendous knowledge of terrorism, its motivations, what's behind it, uh, historical trends, statistics, where does terrorism happen across the world, we can then have that discussion on terrorism. Likewise, for the issue of sexual harassment versus promiscuity, those are two different discussions. They must be separated and discussed in a different realm. Having said this, I'd like to begin the presentation today on the name of God, al -Ba'ith. and. It's gonna be a series, and I know I'm kind of slow, and I have been trying to push myself to speed up more, and I apologize that I am a little bit slow in trying to get the work out there. But this is about al bath of the Resurrector. I'd like to bring up my power slides, but before I do so, I want to explain that there was a discussion that took place not too long ago with a coworker that sort of helped me to then finally get my idea regarding this particular name that I want to bring forth. And it was me and a, and a coworker were having a discussion and he mentioned he's breeding his dog, a, a new dog, a hunting dog. So we got into discussions from there into IVF and he mentioned there is this case and I'll put that in by the way, the uh, description of this video so that you can look at it. He mentioned the case where a woman recently gave birth to a frozen embryo that has been frozen for like, I don't know, two dec over two decades. And that science has now advanced to such a state or such, you might say, a degree that you can freeze an embryo for who knows how many decades. Uh, scientists are not sure, but it could be like even hundreds, hundred of year, hundred years. And you know, we went back and forth on that discussion. I said, you know, that just seems like a recent case that took place in Minnesota, not too, probably a few years back, where people donate their bodies to science, and those bodies were put in a, in a scientific museum, and they were turned into pieces of art, uh, where you could see now their lungs, you could see their brains, they would show you their muscles, but the body was really turned into a sculpture, uh, a form of artwork, and to benefit science. And I said, the issue that I have with this type of work is that 
we're reducing human beings now to commodities that we can turn into artwork, <laughs> excuse me, as well as we can buy and sell, not just their organs, but you know, there's probably a purpose behind like saving a life. But now that we're buying and selling them, so we're no longer like spiritual beings uh, that we're going to be resurrected. But now we've turned into objects and bought and sold and into commodities. So we went back and forth uh, on that discussion and it led into a documentary that he pointed me, he pointed me to and I'll share that with you. And I thought it was a very interesting documentary because then it made me sort of help me to reconcile my thoughts further. It was about the radioactive incident that took place in Chernobyl, I think it was in 1986. I have to double check the exact year. But it was, I watched the documentary, it's on YouTube by the way, and I'll point you to it. And it's a really interesting documentary about how, you know, uh, a town turned into a dead man zone and another set of species like animals and wildlife inherited the town. And according you know, to my coworker, he saw it as, he said he, his understanding of the documentary was that human beings, it turns out, he says to him, are more toxic to planet Earth than radioactive material because once you remove uh, human beings from that particular place, it became like a dead man's zone, then all the wildlife, you know, from plants as well as animals and wolves, uh, bison, horses started to uh, inherit that place and they started to multiply and survive and live amongst each other. Uh, you've got all these various animals living amongst each other and surviving and breeding and growing and once human beings were removed. And you know, we sort of, again, it was just a discussion and I went ahead and did watch, like I said, the video. But then I started to think about this uh, further and it brought me back to a blog that I had written like around in 2009. And that's how I would like to begin my presentation. So let me just bring up some of the slides and I hope, again, it just will bring you to a point where you can just reflect, read about it and try to decide um, what, how you want to process this information. Again, like I said, it, does it did take me some time, so try not to rush it. Uh, maybe sit with people you trust or you feel comfortable with uh, studying and learning from and try to better understand this material that I'm sharing with you. This one, this one, this one. Okay. So I said, I'm going to start with Al-Ba'ith or the, resurrect the Resurrector. I would like to say that I'm using the book, The Most Beautiful Names. It's compiled by Sheikh Tusan Bayrak Al-Jahar Al-Jirahi Al-Habiti. So it's a very good book. I really do like this book. And I'm very... Uh, much recommended. Not only does it give you all the beautiful names of God, but at the very end of the book, it also gives you all the beautiful names that have been given to Prophet Muhammad upon him, be, upon him peace and blessings. So I would encourage you to look through this book, um, The Most Beautiful Names of God. And like I said, if you look at it, this is who it's compiled by. Um, I'm going to be reading the section on Al-Bahid. And as I begin, I want to say again, we're going to start with that discussion that I had with my coworker. And so I started to think about the IVF discussion and the woman who had um, the children, the child, excuse me, after that was from a frozen embryo that was, what is it, um, over two decades old. And as I thought about it, I said, you know, this reminded me of how at times when faith is undermined, God uses the exact same 
You know, it's amazing. The exact same medicine that is used to undermine faith, he uses that same medicine uh, to tackle uh, the disease. Uh, an example of that is during Prophet Moses' time, magic was used um, to undermine faith. And so God sent Moses with a stick to smack uh, and destroy magic. And where he turned the uh, stick into uh, the staff, excuse me, into a snake, a real live snake, and destroyed uh, uh, the magic. During the, uh, the time of Prophet Jesus, uh, upon him peace, um, again, they were using certain healing and and. and, and he was brought as a healer, was able to bring, you know, the, the dead back to life, was able to bring uh, people who were blind to make them see all by the will of God. So, and again, he used the, he used, you know, the faith uh, and to, to, to respond to people who were using these sort of snake oil treatments to take care of people and, and claim a sense of, uh, or to undermine, you might say, the, the faith community. Um, similarly, like during the time of Prophet Abraham, upon him peace, he also used uh, the medicine that they had used at the same time. Uh, they, had, they were worshiping these idols and claiming that they had a sense of greatness and power, so he was able to turn them to the idol itself he destroyed some of the idols and he turned them to the biggest one. He told them to go ahead and ask them, ask that big one to uh, tell them what happened. So pretty much he used the very same, uh, whatever they can consider to be a God or whatever they cherished uh, or thought that cherished and sustained him. He used that as the medicine to bring forth the truth. And it was kind of interesting. In this day and age, science is being used at times to undermine faith. It's almost as though, and I, I try to write some blogs and I try to put you know, a little bit here, a little bit there to get people to think about these things. And I think at times it's like, there's supposed to be this clash between science and faith. And there isn't really a clash. We can use science to bear witness to the magnificence of God and the attributes of God and his most beautiful names. And that's the point of this presentation. So to begin, there's a verse in the Quran that says, and when thy Lord drew forth from the children of Adam, from their loins, their descendants, and made them testify concerning themselves, saying, am I not your Lord who cherishes and sustains you? They said, yes, we do testify. So if we look at the scientific advancement today, initially we could not wrap our minds around this verse. We probably are thinking like, how is it that God drew forth from the children of Adam, from their loins, their descendants? And, you know, we're probably like thinking that just doesn't make sense. But now we're seeing that science is indeed taking sperms and taking eggs, and they are literally creating embryos, and they are freezing them, and they are saving them for two decades later before they are implanted into somebody and they are brought, they are giving birth to that embryo. So we can see, we can bear witness using signs. We can bear witness to the words of God. We can also bear witness to the beautiful attribute of God, al bayt that here he is, when he chooses, when he wills, he can bring somebody to life. So science and, and faith is not clashing. It's actually coming very much together, hand in hand, and clasping each other. Uh, we're right now bearing witness to the fact that in our pre-eternal realm, God drew forth from, the children, uh, from Adam all his children that will come. And when he wills, he brings them to life. So we could see that right now happening and we could bear witness to it. Al-Bad. The other thing I wanted to mention The other discussion that I had, like I said, with my coworker had to do with about that radioactive incident in Chernobyl in 1986. And again, if we look at that incident, here we see 
from the Quran, the behold, thy Lord said to the angels, I will create a vizorant on earth. They said, will, will thou place therein one who will make mischief therein and shed blood? While we do celebrate thy praises and glorify thy holy name. He said, I know what you know not. So we could see even here from this verse, the manifestation of God, al um, that God here brings Adam on earth uh, into a dead man, you might say, a dead man uh, uh, place, because it, and some, some narrations have said that the earth was cleansed from people who were making mischief and shedding blood, but God brings Adam here, divinely planned to come down to earth. And what the video shows, what that documentary shows, is pretty much what the angels had, had borne witness, which is that humanity does make mischief, does shed blood, but there is a higher wisdom of our presence here, that we are recipients of the divine breath. And while when we become divorced of that spiritual reality, when we become divorced uh, of God's presence and of God's attribute, al bayt and of God's uh, very, um, excuse me, of God's very ever presence, then what happens in Chernobyl is what will happen really to our lives. We will become toxic, more toxic on earth, if you will, then that radioactive material was toxic to earth in Chernobyl because once humanity was removed, not that I'm making judgment on them, but just to give you an example of then the entire earth started to inherit and they started to grow and breed and, and come together. You're talking about bisons and, and wolves and horses and all sorts of animals coming together, living and growing on, on earth. So when, when we are with God, then we can kind of coexist with nature and coexist with, with each other. That's al, with, the, with al bad. Another thing I want to mention is, there is a saying by Prophet Muhammad, I think a lot of times people misconstrue the saying, or I personally may be misunderstood. I don't personally agree with their understanding of it. But they go something like this. The one who has no haya can do what he wants. So people interpret this like this. Uh, the ones who feel no shame um, can do what he wants. And I don't think that's what the meaning of the prophet's, excuse me, teaching. Haya actually means life. It doesn't mean shame. Uh, shame in, uh, in Arabic is khizi. And when God talks about uh, humiliation or talks about uh, the punishment of shame, he doesn't say haya, he uses the word khizi in the Quran. Khizi is to humiliate someone to make them feel shame. But that's the type, the way that God does it is he exposes the person that they really have, here they're claiming the sense of power and their sense of greatness and God exposes them on the day of judgment that they actually have no power and all power belongs um, to God. Uh, but Haya actually comes similarly again, comes, it's derived when you're connected with al bayt or you bear witness to al bayt the resurrector, then you're connect, then you have Haya because you're conscious of him and you're bearing witness to that, if you will, manifestation of his name. As it says in the book, this attribute of Allah is so important that it is one of the seven affirmations, the last condition of faith. For the faithful must declare that he believes he will be brought back to life, haya, after death. This is true. It is real. It certainly will happen. So God has made this truth known in all books he has revealed and through all the prophets whom he has sent. Um, if, if further talks about several verses that mentions about the day of judgment, and I'll, I'll refer to them. So Haya, I believe it has less to do with shame, the way it's been constantly misconstrued 
and more to do with life, that which brings a person to life, remembrance of God, um, praying to God, um, being conscious of God, uh, fulfilling God's commands. Uh, that's what brings you to life. Uh, but it doesn't mean to be ashamed because you can't approach God if you're sitting here feeling a sense of shame. It doesn't like benefit God if you're feeling shame. Shame and remorse is totally different. Remorse is I did something wrong. Uh, shame is I hate myself. You're feeling bad about yourself and you're more worried about what people think about you. So people sometimes misconstrue haya and shame. Haya, can, you can, for example, sometimes as human beings, and just human nature, we don't believe in something unless we experience it, unless we see it, we touch it. We need science. In this day and age, again, it's science. I don't believe in God unless I see him. I don't believe in the day of judgment unless I see it. I don't believe in one, two, three, unless I see, I hear, I touch. And so we're living in this day and age where we want to experience, we want to touch, measure, feel, uh, all of these things that faith claims before we believe. And if we open up our eyes, we find that God is manifesting his signs and he's manifesting his reality and he's manifesting his attributes through science and, and through signs and through realities to help us to, to bear witness that indeed there is the day of judgment. Indeed, uh, there was a pre-eternal realm. Uh, so we are seeing some of these things that help us reflect on the truth of some of the statements uh, or in some of the verses that are in the Quran. So one way that we can, like I say, believe in something is if we experience it. Like if you have a, a hot cup of coffee and you tell the child, don't touch that because it's hot, most children will not believe you. So you take sometimes a mother to teach the child. They'll take the finger and then they'll let him touch the tea or touch the hot water. Say hot, hot. So that they experience it, now they know it's hot. And so they move their hands. So now they've associated the word hot with ex the experience of hot. Some children, they have that level of trust with the parent. Now, of course, we're talking about a healthy parent here. Um, and the parent will tell them, don't touch hot, and they will not touch. It'll be like, you know, a happy child will not touch it. Some will insist on going, and they'll want to touch it. They'll want to experience that it's hot. That's one way that you can bring a person to life is through experience. It's helping them to experience, um, the rea you know, some of the attributes and some of the realities that God wants them to know to prepare them for the hereafter. Another way is through knowledge, because we are all ignorant. And another way that we come more to life uh, is like the way the Holy Quran likened knowledge to haya and to an ignorance or, you know, to death. So another way that we can come back to life is by seeking knowledge. Again, it goes into hand in hand with science, because science encourages um, knowledge and so does the Quran and so does faith you know genuine true faith encourages knowledge because ignorant is easy it can can harm you if you're ignorant how are you going to worship God and, and believe in him so that's something to keep in mind as we go forth so some of the verses in the Quran that refers to al baith and verily the hour will come there can be no doubt about it or about the fact that Allah or God will raise up all who are in the graves. In another verse in the Quran, from the earth did we create you and into it shall we return you and from it shall, shall we bring you out once again. And then in another verse, It is God who created you further. He has provided for your sustenance and he will cause you to die. And again, he will give you life. Are there any of your false partners who can do any single one of these things? Glory to him and high is he above the partners they attribute to him. Um, 
So these are some of the verses that talk about the day of judgment. And why is that important for us? And why is this particular reference? And, and it, it takes you a while sometimes to think about it because at times when you're talking with people, I, I, I realized um, we don't all have the same social position in life. And again, haya or al if you it goes back to being alive, it has nothing to do with shame. It has to be God conscious. Now, if you're God conscious, uh, like Joseph was, um, Prophet Joseph, excuse me, upon him peace, was in the kingdom. When you're conscious of God, then you have haya in the sense that you're always aware that God is going to be watching you. And so you're alive. You're going to be alive because you know that God is there and he's going to call you to account. Now, if you have the social position, like the king's wife, if you will, and God, and she didn't have haya, not in the sense of shame, but in the sense of knowing God, uh, connection to that spiritual, her spiritual well-being, her spiritual reality, or knowing about the day of judgment, but she had power. And there's no one to call her to account. And we see this in humanity. And it says, even in the Quran, one of the ways that God describes their thought process, and they think there is no one to call them to account. Because some human beings have this station in society and have this position or privilege that there's no one to call them to account. You can go to the United Nations, they have the power to veto. You can go to the police, they might have such a relationship with the police that you'll be shut down. You can go to the president, they'll have that relationship, they'll knock you out, you'll be silenced. So the only way that you can communicate with such individuals, and this is the way Moses has communicated with the Pharaoh, is if you have, you, there are people in society that have that station like the Pharaoh, nobody can call them to, to account except God, but they become deluded. And it's, it's fruitless somehow giving them numbers and dates and, and, and anything else. The best way is to put before them the day of judgment, that you are going to be, there's one that's going to call you to account. And that's what Prophet Abraham, upon him peace, did to Nimrod. He said, you know, can you make the sun rise from the west? It rises from the east. Can you make it rise from, from the west? To try to make him realize that you're not in power, that there's one in who has power over you, will call you to account. So this particular name helps us to also understand two types of conversations. One is, or two types of deceptions. One is you deny the human condition, and that's usually what happens sometimes, that people do deny their human condition, and I mentioned that in some of the blogs. But there's the other, is that you deny the day of judgment, and the Quran mentions it and they deny the day of judgment, and they deny the day of judgment. So it's very important to bring that forth because the discussion with such individuals has no fruit and has no bearing if they feel there's no one to call them to account. Because if there's no one to call you to account, and you feel that and you believe that you are dead, you, are, you have no haya, so naturally you're going to do what you want. You know, very few people, if you put them in a position where they feel they have no one to call them to account, absolutely no one, and you give them that power and you give them that prestige and you give them that sense of whatever it is, and, and they feel in their mind that no one will call them to account, and they don't believe in the day of judgment that they're going to do the right thing. Uh, I, I just have a hard time believing that. Uh, unless you believe in the day of judgment, unless you believe in accountability, unless you believe that God is going to be bringing you to account for everything you do, you are literally dead. You are literally dead. It doesn't matter if you're on the top of the who knows where in the station of the privileged uh, ladder. At the end of the day, you are dead because you're disconnected from your soul. You're disconnected from your spiritual reality. And that's why Moses came, when he went to the Pharaoh, he wanted to try to remind him. He wanted to try to bring him back to life. Not physically, but spiritually, he was doing some sort of resuscitation, you might will, a spiritual CPR to bring him back to life, to try to get him to reflect, try to get him to remember his reality, that he's a human being, 
that he's going to be brought back to life. So that's also an important part of the conversation that we need to have with people we disagree with at times. It's not enough to just give facts and statistics because if the people you're, you're having a conversation with really believe there's no one to call them to account, I do believe you have to put before them al bad And I do believe that you have to remind them that there is one that's going to call you to account. Um, that doesn't mean that we can control God and we can tell him what a point in time that he needs to call people to account. But we do need to put that in front of them out there. And we see, I just want to share um, a particular situation that took place with the Prophet, upon peace and blessings, as well as somebody during his time, Ubay ibn Khalaf, Khalaf, yeah. Um, again, here the Prophet was having a conversation with him, and Ubay uh, crushed decayed old bones between his fingers and threw them in the Prophet's face, saying, so you claim he will revive these rotten bones. So again, you see that mentality of, first of all, he doesn't believe anyone will call him to account, and then he's denying the day of judgment. So this person will do what he wants because he's spiritually dead, no haya. That's what no haya means, not shame. This person doesn't feel shame. He's feeling, sp he's spiritually dead. That's what's going on here. He's spiritually dead. There's no life in him. And so he's looking at the prophet and he's throwing it in his face. He's saying, so you claim that he will revive these brought in bones. So the prophet upon him, peace and blessing said, indeed, so will he recreate you so that he will put you in his fire. On this occasion, the following uh, verses were revealed. Says he, who will give life to the bones when they are rotten? Say, he will give life to them who brought them into existence at first. Remember the frozen embryo and how when he decided, God decided for that person to come into existence, they came into existence. And he is the knower of all creation. So God's promise of us being brought back to life on the day of judgment is, is sure. And a lot of times, I think we overlook this conversation and we think because for a faith community, we cannot discuss this with people who are in positions of power. And I really feel that we really do need to push this conversation forth because you need to put God in people's face. And I don't mean in a way that you're like sitting here judging them and telling them what's going to happen, but you do need to let them know there is one that's going to call you to account. There is one that's going to call you to account. Um, Another thing uh, that I'd like to end with is whoever revives himself before the death of ignorance, excuse me, from the death of ignorance into the life of knowledge, or whoever helps another to be reborn into knowledge from the, from the tomb or the grave of ignorance, will then see the manifestation of al -Bad. So we can see uh, the manifestation of that. And I want to show um, that video and I encourage you to watch it, you can kind of see the manifestation of al bayt in this particular video. So I don't want to give too much information. I try to keep all well, the advice and keep my videos shorter as they, as they have requested. So I'd like you to reflect on the material. I, I do hope you would give me uh, constructive feedback if you've seen anything that's wrong or errant or needs to be fixed. I would like to redo the video. And I'd like to share with you, like I said, that particular Mm -hmm. 
the large reason why these animals seem to be persisting in high densities or a high abundance within the exclusion zone is because of the absence of humans. As you drive around the exclusion zone, you're overcome by uh, all the lush nature. It's really an eerie reminder of the tragic human impact that occurred there back around 30 years ago. The Chernobyl exclusion zone is basically a 30 kilometer radius that was created that extends around the nuclear reactor where the accident occurred. And within that 30 kilometer zone, that's where preventative measures were taken to exclude people. So all the towns, villages, cities within that area, that 30 kilometer area were evacuated. years after the accident, this uh, wood lens increased up to uh, one and a half or more times. So now approximately 70% of the area forest. If we talk about large mammals like carnivores and ungulates, it's really good habitat because uh, it's a wild territory now and especially this uh, very wild spot uh, um, along the border with Belarus. Uh, and uh, also many different water sources uh, uh, like lakes and rivers and springs. So the work that we've been involved with in the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone has been to look at the distribution and relative abundance of wildlife, particularly large mammals and, and especially carnivores specifically looking at radiation contamination. So as you move from areas of, of low to high contamination, do you see a subsequent drop off in uh, the number of species that you detect, the, the relative abundance of those animals? The species we most commonly documented were raccoon dogs, large numbers of photographs of, of gray wolves, red fox, Eurasian boar, Eurasian badger, when we have human dominated landscapes, we have lower densities of animals, especially animals that come into conflict with humans like wolves. And so after people were removed, even though the landscape was highly contaminated, it allowed them to increase. What this research is not looking at is the individual health of those animals. So it doesn't suggest that these animals are incredibly healthy, although on the surface they appear very healthy. It doesn't imply that there aren't more uh, subtle genetic effects, and that's an important area that I think we need to continue to explore with future research down the road. So I just want to encourage you, if you will, to, to watch that documentary, I'll include it in the description. Of, um, this is like a short trailer about it, but I, I would encourage you to go and watch the entire documentary. Uh, one of the questions that I have had towards my blogs is one people, some people mocked and ridiculed that, uh, how could I mention Prophet uh, Solomon upon in peace, heard the ants and was able to respond to the ants. And if you see this documentary, and I, like I said, you could look at some other scientific documentaries, which again, you could bear witness to what the Quran is, is saying is, um, this particular scientist learned the language of wolves and he was able to communicate with wolves. So if you look through the documentary, it's only like less than an hour, like 55 minutes. If you look at it, like I said, you'll bear witness to al -Ba'ith how this dead land is being brought back to life and how when we are dead when we are disconnected from god not that again i'm passing judgment on anybody but as human beings in general like i showed in the verse um from the quran where the angels bore witness uh that human beings shed blood and they do corruption so i'm referring to human beings in general not passing judgment and group but how we can destroy a town to such that we are more toxic to earth and more toxic to each other and then radioactive material is to earth or to those animals, carnivores, animals around us. So it's just something to reflect on, something to see, watch the documentary, watch again science, 
um, reinforce that yes, we can communicate with animals too. Again, there's a, there's a verse in the Quran where Prophet Suleiman, uh, Solomon, on peace, heard the, the ants. So yes, human beings can communicate with animals. So you'll see in that video that the scientist was communicating with wolves. Uh, so I don't want to keep ranting on and on, but do please watch this documentary and do just reflect on the material and take your time to understand al baith and then bear witness to al baith around you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And again, I look forward to any constructive criticism. Assalamu alaikum.